Well, I wanna say happy Mother's Day to all of you moms out there. I wanna say to my mom, uh, happy Mother's Day to you, mom. There is nothing like the love and the influence of a mother. And to my wife, Jennifer, happy Mother's Day to you. You're an amazing mother to our four children. And to Kathy, my mother-in-law, I love you. We celebrate moms today at Church of the King. You know, we have all been in a season of uncertainty. Matter of fact, we are in a series here at Church of the King teaching about how do we deal with seasons of uncertainties in our life? How do we navigate through? What does the Bible say about how to push through seasons of uncertainty? And maybe that's where you are right now. Even as I speak, you're dealing with maybe a budget shortfall. You're like, Pastor, man, I don't really know what to do. I, 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 my business, there's so much uncertainty attached to that. And because of that, you have feelings that have come forth. Feelings of fear, feelings of worry, anxiety. We often see anxiety that's attached to uncertainty. Maybe you're a college student, you're like, you know, Pastor Steve, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the future. And is my college going to open up? And are we going to just do online? And should I do that? Should I go back to school? Should I just work a semester until we kind of get past all of this? See, that's uncertainty. The question is, what do you do when you don't know what to do? I've been there before. I'll never forget in 2008. Our church was eight years old. And man, I was so excited. We had so much vision so many good things were happening at Church of the King and we had expansion plans and we were designing in our Mandeville campus a, a wonderful facility to be able to accommodate all the people that were coming and little did I know, little did all of us know that a financial crash was right on the horizon. And I'll never forget when that happened and we had already broke ground on our building and we had laid our slab and we were so excited and boy, we then entered into a season that I had never experienced before. You talk about uncertainty. And there comes those feelings of fear, anxiety, worry. And we're grappling with all those realities. And, and the question, what do you do when you don't know what to do? And maybe that's where you are right now. Maybe you're, you're having to make some big decisions. And you're like, Steve, I don't know what to do. The question is, what does God tell us in his word? Is there any keys or is there any biblical insight that we can gain to help navigate through times of uncertainty. We've been looking at the children of Israel in the book of Exodus, chapter 14, when they were in a very difficult place. Matter of fact, they had been delivered from Egyptian bondage. They were there 400 years in Egypt, serving Pharaoh, and, and now they'd come into a moment where they were delivered from Egypt, and they were facing the Red Sea, and they weren't sure what to do and how they were gonna get around it, and just when they thought, maybe we can just turn around and go, they saw Pharaoh's army coming behind them. In other words, they couldn't go forward, but they couldn't go backwards. That's where some of you guys are right now. And you feel stuck and, and you're not sure what to do. And it was in that moment that God spoke to Moses, their leader. And God told Moses, tell the children of Israel to do these things. I want to read again in Exodus chapter 14, starting in verse 13. I want to read a couple of scriptures. This is so powerful because this is where some of you are right now. You're, you're, you, you feel stuck between a rock and a hard place. And you're asking God, God, what do I do? What do you do when you don't know what to do? Listen to what God told Moses to tell the children of Israel. And Moses said to the people, number one, do not be afraid. Number two, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Next verse, watch verse 14. And the Lord will fight for you. Isn't that powerful? Man, I want God fighting my battles. How about you? And the Lord will fight for you. And you shall hold your peace. Boy, isn't that a beautiful word? The peace of God. I want to talk to you today about how we can walk in supernatural peace. Look at the fourth thing that God told Moses to tell the children of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. God tells Moses, tell them four things. Number one, fear not. 
Number two, stand still. By the way, we talked last week, standing still in the Bible is never, it's never passively resigning yourself to circumstances, but it's actively standing in faith on the word of God, believing that at any moment, at any moment, God's gonna show up. Something's gonna happen. We're standing, we're trusting God. Number one, stand, listen, fear not. Number two, stand still. Number three, hold your peace. And number four, go forward. Today, I wanna talk to you about what does the Bible mean by, quote, holding your peace? You know, in this series, we're learning We're learning how to navigate. I trust that this has become maybe a decision-making grid for all of us, that that we can use this. Because the, the, the issue is, is that whether we are in this particular challenge or another challenge, there are always natural human responses to uncertainty, fear, anxiety, worry. That's why, fear not. Stand still, hold your peace and go forward. There is a battle for peace in our lives. I'm convinced that one of the greatest ploys of the enemy is to keep us so bound up, so worried, so agitated, to steal peace out of our lives. If he can get us out of peace, if he can get us into anxiety and worry and fear, where we're not walking in God's peace and his supernatural peace, I'm telling you, God, I believe, is hindered from working in our lives. Why? Because when there's an attitude of faith and expectancy and peace, we have a clear mind, a heart is open. That's why the enemy wants to knock us around. He wants to get us moving back and forth, all worried and agitated and filled with anxiety. Today, you may be anxious. There may be some aspect of your life that you're grappling with right now due to this crisis. Maybe you've been treated unfairly Maybe you're a little bit disappointed in in somebody. Maybe you're disappointed in God. If you're like, God, where are you? And well, I wanna encourage you, God is with you. And God wants to help you. God's not your problem, God is actually your solution. God wants to help you to navigate through this time of uncertainty, to get you to a place of faith where you're dynamically trusting Christ. And not necessarily where all of our circumstances change, but where you can have faith and peace in the midst of them. I know that some of you guys are saying, man, I just, can't, I just can't wait till everything goes back to normal. Then everything's gonna be okay. See, here's what I've found though, that when you and I get through this situation, there's gonna be another situation. And then there's gonna be another situation. Why? We live in a broken world. We've got to learn how to stay in peace. You and I have gotta learn how to walk in the supernatural peace that only Jesus gives. Why is that? Because there's gonna become another challenge. And then another challenge, and then another challenge. How many times have you said this? I've said this, if I can just get through this crisis, if I can just get through this. And so in other words, I'm waiting to experience peace inwardly until I get to the other side. Question, is it possible to experience peace when you're in the storm? One of the greatest biblical accounts of a storm in all of the Bible, it has to be Mark chapter four. It's the classic story when all of the disciples are in the boat with Jesus and and Jesus is sleeping in the boat while they are in the midst of a storm. Mark chapter four, verse 37, the Bible says, and a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat. That's what some of you guys feel like, man, Pastor, there's so much going on in my life right now. There's so much beating against me right now so that the boat was already filling up But Jesus was in the stern. Listen to this. He was in the boat asleep on a pillow. And they they, they awoke him and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? That's where some of you guys are right now. There's so many waves and so much going around you. Like, does God see? Yes, he sees. Does God care? Yes, he cares. And then he arose and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. So so here it is. Jesus is asleep in a boat. And this huge storm comes and the winds are fierce. And they wake him up and he says, peace be still. Question, why was he able to say, peace be still to the storm? I'll tell you why. Because the storm wasn't raging on the inside of him. In other words, you and I can be in a storm, but not allow the storm to be in us. Pastor Steve, is that possible? It sure is. 
Again, God doesn't promise that all of our circumstances are gonna change, but we can have supernatural peace in the midst of the storm. I wanna show you in my message today that, that, that we can walk in peace, and that's why God told the children of Israel, they were freaking out. They were right there. The Red Sea Pharaoh's army says, hold your peace. In other words, stay in peace. Don't get knocked out of peace. Don't, no, that's where God is telling you right now with your business, don't get knocked out of peace. Maybe in a family situation, don't get knocked out of peace. Stay in faith, stay in peace. I'm working. I have your back. I'm for you. Stay in peace. I've been walking many, many, many years with Jesus, and I've walked through many, many transitions in my own life and with people. And I got to tell you, though, if the enemy can steal your peace, get you all messed up, you know, you driving in your car, somebody cuts you off, man, you're worshiping God, and all of a sudden, you just want to just, you just all of a sudden, in a moment like that, we can lose our peace. How can we go from the, from the very presence of God to the very flesh? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Man, you know, something happens, and all of a sudden, you know, you get somebody that disappoints you at work, and you're in this great mood, boom, one moment, you can change. Why? You can, we all can get knocked out of peace so quickly. We've got to learn to stay in peace, regardless of the storm. I love that scripture. I love this scripture in John chapter 14 where Jesus says, don't let, listen, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. He continues in verse 27. He says, I am leaving you with a gift. Peace is a gift that you can experience today, that I can experience today. I'm leaving you with a gift. It's the peace of mind and peace in the heart. And the peace I give you is a gift the world can't give. You don't get this by anything else. You don't get this from the outside. It bubbles up from the inside. The world cannot give it to you, so don't be troubled or afraid. There are things that we can't change, sir. There's things that we cannot change. And we put so much energy trying to change our circumstances, trying to change our environment. What we can change is what's happening on the inside. We can't change some of the restrictions that we have right now. We can't change some of the decisions that have been made for us as a society that, 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 that we're good citizens. We trust Jesus, but we're good citizens. We can't, there's things that we can't change around us. There's things that you can't change. Those of you that, that live in New Orleans or live on the North Shore and you go back and forth, maybe on the calls, where you can't change when there's fog on the bridge. You can't change that but you can make a choice to cooperate with all the other traffic that's going very slow in your estimation. You, you and I have to learn to, 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 to address the things that we can change, but to accept the things that we can't change. But the thing that we can change, we can always change what's happening on the inside of us. We can't change always the storms that rage around us, but we can always address the storm that rages within us. I got to tell you, there's been times in my life, man, there's been times I remember back in 2010, there was a, a storm that was raging around me that I allowed to move on the inside of me. And I, and I, and I remember, boy, there was just the anxiety that I was feeling. And it was during those times where God began to show me and God began to teach me, Steve, listen, you've got to learn. And I'm the type of person, are you this type of person? I always thought, well, when I get to this place, then I'm going to feel better. When I accomplish this goal, when I accomplish this task. And then I began to realize I had what's called a destination disease. That when I get through this, then I'll feel better. No, no God began to tell me that I've got to learn to contend for peace and stay in peace, even amidst the storm. I'm gonna give you guys three things that I trust will help you today. Three keys to staying in peace. Number one, if you're gonna live in peace regardless of your circumstance, regardless. Now, by the way, I love when my circumstances change and I'm believing God and trusting God that they will change. But if they don't change or if it takes a while for them to change, number one, I gotta realize this. I've gotta realize that God is in control of my life. The first step to really walking in peace, the first step to living in peace, I gotta realize that God is in control of my life. We often stress out when we think that we have to keep our world controlled. Man, I've got a control issue sometimes. Where I, I gotta feel like if I can just keep everything in line, it's like that person that's got the, the, the plates that are spinning and you got this and you, and you got that. Some of you 
Moms know what I'm talking about. Some of you folks that have been schooling your children the last month or so, you're just, if I can just keep it all together. Well, there's things that we can control, but there's things that we can't control. And we stress out. We get worried. We get anxious. I heard one time somebody said that worry is temporary atheism. Why is that? Well, the reason is that when we worry, we're temporarily losing sight of the fact that God is in control of our lives. And I think in this, in this moment particularly, that, that I think that there's been such a challenge for all of us because there's so much negativity around us. There's so many challenges around us. Economic challenges, health challenges, relational challenges, all kind of challenges that we can lose sight of the fact that we belong to God. That God is in control of our lives. That, 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 that Jesus Christ out on the cross to purchase our lives. That if we'll trust him as our savior, as we trust him as our Lord, that, that we belong to God. Man, I lose sight of that. And when I do lose sight of that, that's when worry kicks in. It's almost a direct proportion. The more that I realize that God is in control of my life, watch this, worry is reduced. The more I forget the fact that God is in control of my life, worry increases. Number one, if you and I want to live in peace, we've got to realize that God is in control of our lives. You know, one of my favorite scriptures, I probably have six or seven key scriptures. You'll hear me talk about them all the time. And one of those is Romans 8, 28. And let me tell you why. It's so powerful. It's so redemptive. Let, let me read it to you. Romans 8, 28. I love this scripture. You need to memorize this scripture. This will bring, so, this will bring peace to your soul, regardless of of what you're going through. Listen to this. And we know, Paul writes to the church at Rome, he says, we know that all things, yeah, even negative things, we know that all things work together for good. I didn't say that God sent all things. I didn't say that God causes all things. I am saying that God can take all things. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Do you love God? And those who are called according to his purpose. I, I remember when I graduated, I graduated from college in 91 and Bible school in 93. And then I came back to New Orleans and started in the seminary. And I'll never forget during that time, I, I felt, man, I was ready to preach. I felt I was called to ministry. And, and this was the moment. And, and yet I don't know why I didn't really have an opportunity at that time the way that I thought. I remember I was working at a restaurant, Semolina's restaurant on Metairie Road. Some of you guys may live close to there, know exactly where that was. And I never forget, man, going through that time. And I had a, a friend from college and he came up to me and he, he hadn't seen me in a couple of years. And he was wondering, Steve, why are you working here? And I thought you were called to ministry. And God, like, what are you doing? And, and you know what I realized during that time? That my timing is not always God's timing. And what happens is when my timing doesn't align with God's timing, I lose sight of the fact that God is in control of my life and his timing is good. See, God's also working in me. Before God wants to work through you, he's working deep within you. And the reality is, is that I've, I had to believe God, that God had a perfect timing for my life. God is working all things. I want to encourage you right now. Even in the midst of hardship, even in the midst of pain, and some of you guys are experiencing deep pain in your heart, God is working. Trust him. All things. Can you say that with me? Say it. All things work together for your good and his glory, if you'll trust him. Number one, if you and I are gonna stay in peace and not freak out and, and not wig out, if we're gonna stay locked into the peace of God, living in peace, even when a storm is going around us, we've gotta, number one, realize and recognize that God is in control of our lives. Number two, the second thing that we've gotta realize is that God's peace is not based upon our circumstances. You see, the peace of God transcends our circumstances. And that's one of the challenges that I had. Because I, I had this problem in my life and I still struggle with it at times. And here it is, here's how it works. I said it before, I'll say it again. I, I, I often bought into a lie and it is a lie that when I get to the other side of this, then I'll feel peaceful. But right now, I've got to fight. I, I can't feel. It's almost like I never gave myself permission to experience the peace of Jesus amidst the storm. And yet, I realize now that I can experience the peace of Jesus in the middle of the storm. 
You see, it's not that you have to get to the other side before you can experience peace. You can actually experience the peace of Jesus as you're walking through the storm, as you're living amidst the storm. But if you think that your peace is based upon your circumstance, that's how the world is, right? How are you doing? Great. Why? Because everything's going great. But what happens if something doesn't go well with your job? What happens if something doesn't go well with a child? What happens if something doesn't go well? I don't do, I'm not doing, how are you doing? Not good. Why? Because of that. So in other words, in the world, our feelings of satisfaction, our feelings of peace, our feelings of contentment, our internal world is so manipulated by our external world. And yet, peace is a gift that Jesus promises to his followers that is independent of our circumstances. I love the Apostle Paul. I teach a lot out of the New Testament and of course the old and new, but I, but I love the Apostle Paul and it's because he found himself in so many circumstances that were less than favorable. In other words, he was in a prison. Well, what did he do? He said, all right, I'm in a prison. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He began to write two thirds of the New Testament. While in prison, Paul the Apostle understood how to grapple with circumstances. I had a guy tell me one time, man, I wish I was in the Bible, not me. Oh man. These people, God shows us all they're good, they're bad, and they're ugly. So when I read something that Paul wrote, and we believe the, Holy, the, the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but I love reading what Paul wrote because when Paul writes something, I know that this is a man that grappled with in, intense circumstances. Listen to what Paul says about peace. This is so powerful. Paul says this in Philippians chapter four. He's writing to the church at Philippi, and here's what he says. Now think about this. Here's a man. He was whipped, left for dead. He was shipwrecked. The Bible says a night and a day in the deep. He's in prison writing. Listen to what Paul says. He says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Can I pause there for a moment? Can you imagine the quality of your life and my life if we actually, if, if this was actually part of our lives? Be anxious for nothing. Oh my gosh. If, if I learn how to conquer anxiety, if I learn how to walk through anxiety, wow, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Let me read the next verse. This is so good. And the peace of God, there it is, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, it will guard your hearts, and your minds through Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul learned the secret of how to stay in peace regardless of his circumstances. In other words, he learned how to fly higher. It wasn't that he wasn't buffeted. It wasn't that he wasn't persecuted. It wasn't that he didn't end up in jail for preaching the gospel at times and how to grapple with all of those circumstances, but he understood how to fly higher. It's interesting, I was reminded as I was putting this message together of a, of a bird that the Bible often, there's a powerful analogy in scripture where the Bible likens a man or a woman of faith to an eagle. Isaiah talks about that we mount up like, with wings like eagles. And there, there, it's an interesting bird. And, and, and there, is an, there is a, what I would call an antagonist if you understand Greek plays, there's a protagonist and there's an antagonist. The antagonist to the eagle is the crow. And it's interesting if you've ever been outside in the forest area and you've seen an eagle, they, they, they do not, and you can read about this, they do not like the crow. It's almost like crows strategically will come up and try to steal the peace of the eagle. But God designed the eagle with an amazing wingspan. And the way that the eagle gets away from the crows, you know, you know a crow, caw, caw, they, just come, they just come after that eagle. The way that they get away from them is not by turning and fighting them, but by stretching out their wingspans and hitting that, 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 that wind current. and brings them up so, It brings them up higher than the crow can fly. Matter of fact, some eagles have actually been visibly measured, you know, because they've been equal with planes at 20,000 feet. In other words, crows can't fly that high, but eagles can. God has designed you, sir, 
God has designed you, ma'am, to fly higher. What that means is, is that you don't have to be drawn down. You don't have to get down in the ditch with all your circumstances and all the bad attitudes and all the worry and all the bitterness. You may be with some people that are so upset. They're mad at this. They're mad at these people. They're mad at this group. You know what I'm talking about. They're always mad at somebody. You don't have to be pulled down on that. In other words, you don't have to lose your peace. You don't have to lose your cool. You, you don't have to walk in stress and anxiety and fear and worry, but you can fly higher. Paul says, in the peace of God, which surpasses your cognitive reasoning skills, in other words, your cognitive mental, where, where, you're, where you're always analyzing all the negative scenarios that could happen to you. And yet, even amidst all that, you can experience a peace that'll guard your hearts and minds. Paul says, that's a gift, and it's available to you. Number one, we've got to realize that God's in control of our lives. Number two, we've got to realize that God's peace is not based upon our circumstances. And number three, we've got to remember to practice the presence of God on a daily basis. As human beings, we have to understand that God is not just omnipotent and or omnipresent. Let me say it this way. There's three big terms that people use theologically, the omnipotence of God. Omni is a Latin word which means all omnipotent, all powerful. You ever heard that before? Omniscience, all knowledgeable. But you also hear this other word, omnipresent. Omnipresent means that he's all present. He's not just all present, but he also manifests himself and, and you can actually feel his presence when you worship him. When you honor him, when you spend time in prayer. In other words, you can actually sense the presence of God. Now, that may be new for some people. But when you learn each day to wake up and to press into the presence of Almighty God, it sets your perspective. It doesn't necessarily adjust your circumstances, but it adjusts your attitude. And when you do that in the beginning of the day, uh, C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, he, he said this in Mere Christianity. Some of you may have read the book, one of the most popular books ever written. Here's what C.S. Lewis says. He says, the real problem of the Christian life comes when people do not usually look for it. It comes the very moment that you wake up each morning. All of your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. You ever experienced that before? We all do. And the first job each morning consists simply of shoving them all back and listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. That's the supernatural presence of God. You know, one of the keys that I've found as I've walked with Jesus for 30 years, number one, I wanna realize every day and recognize God is in control of my life. Number two, I've got to recognize that my peace, sir, your peace is not based upon your environment, that you can live in the peace of Jesus independent of your circumstances. But number three, I've got to learn each day how to press into the presence of God, where I can sense the very presence of God, where I can, where I can focus. And, and the key there, it is focusing. I want to encourage you when you wake up in the morning, what do you do the first part of your day? you fill your mind with all the news, I appreciate the news. I, I, I try to manage the content of how much comes into my life. But I'm going to tell you this. The first thing that I do is I don't set my mind on the news. I don't set my mind on the negative, on the bad report. report. I, I want to set my mind on God. And when you set your mind on, on God and you focus on God and you begin to lift your voice to God in your prayer time, in your worship time, in your Bible reading time, and you begin to get filled up with God. I'm reminded of that scripture. There's a promise. It's so powerful in Isaiah chapter 26. Listen to what the writer says. He says that you will keep him, God will keep him in perfect peace. Who's that? Whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. You see, when we focus our minds each morning upon Jesus, when you wake up in the morning, all of us have the opportunity to be just, you know, to be strung out, to be kind of wigged out, to be kind of pulled into the lower levels of life, to be anxious, to be worried, to be fearful. But we make a choice. It's a choice to focus our minds on Jesus, to 
focus our minds on the word of God, to focus our mind on the presence of God as we begin to spend time with God and worship God. I want to encourage you when you wake up in the morning, worship Jesus. Jesus, I worship you. I love you, Lord. Oh man, those thoughts will come. They'll come trying to race at you. But as you cast them aside and say, no, I'm giving the first part of my day to Jesus. I'm going to focus my mind on God. What would happen? What would happen as a church? What would happen as the body of Christ, of all of us right now? What would, what would happen? What would the quality of our life be if we made the choice each day to practice the very presence of God, to spend time with Almighty God? I, I believe your life would change. I know that your life would change. The Bible says, he who sets his mind upon Jesus, if you focus your mind on Jesus, God will keep you in perfect peace. It doesn't mean your circumstances will change, but your heart will be filled with peace. You know, I want to close today, and maybe you've been watching even the last few weeks, and you've noticed Church of the King, this program, and maybe you've been watching us online or TV, whatever it is, and you've been listening to me the last few weeks, and I, and I want to say this to you. We are honored each week for you to tune in. But, you know, the very first step to living in the peace of Jesus is to be at peace with Jesus. And that comes as we trust Christ as our Savior. It's not about going to church. Although going to church, you ought to grow in God, but going to church doesn't necessarily make you a Christian. Hopefully you can find Christ in the church, but it's, 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 it's submitting to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. My question is this, do you know Christ? Have you ever trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? In just a moment, I'm gonna pray for you. Right where you are, wherever you are, maybe in your living room or somewhere in your home or maybe out on a balcony or, or wherever it is that you've been tuning in. I'm gonna take a moment here and I'm gonna pray a prayer. It's not gonna be a deep theological prayer, but it's gonna be an opportunity for you to trust Christ. And when you trust Jesus, I'm telling you, your life will change. I was a freshman at Tulane University. I was 19 years old when I gave my heart to Christ. And I'm telling you, Jesus changed my life. I'm not perfect, but I've been forgiven by the blood of Christ. And I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God and the peace of God lives in my heart. And there's times when I grapple back and forth, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a rock on the inside of me. His name is Jesus. And you can know Christ as a personal Savior to you. Do you know him? Would you bow your heads? And I'm going to pray a prayer. Dear Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me. Make me new. I give you my life. In your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you trusted Christ as your Savior, there are hosts that are online right now that would love to talk to you about what it means to follow Christ. As a church family, we'd love to be able to talk to you. Maybe some of you right now, you're taking a moment and you're not sure and you're just going back and forth. We're gonna take just about 30 seconds and, 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 and the Holy Spirit, the Bible says no one comes to Jesus unless the Spirit of God draws them. And maybe the Spirit of God is drawing you right now. In 30 seconds, we're gonna come back and we're gonna to talk to you more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. God's talking to you right now. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you.
for watching and sharing this time with me today. I pray you're already experiencing new levels of peace in your heart and mind. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, please text DECISION2020 to 25827. And to all of you moms, Happy Mother's Day. I pray you have a wonderful week and like never before that you stay in peace. Remember, God is greater than any uncertainty or challenge you face. God bless you.